Hey, man, you did a good job. Thank you. Penis envy. I don't have penis envy. I have brain envy. I wish I had a brain as big as all of the rest of the TEDx speakers. <laughs> I apologize. I was so excited to start this talk out with the word penis that I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> um, my... my name is Tom Terlemke. I'm a visual artist. I paint, draw, and I sculpt. And I'd like to introduce you to some of my family members. Oh, no, they're not here. You have to imagine them, okay? My great uncle, Freddie, he was deaf and mute, and he babysat me a lot, and he didn't sign or read lips or anything like that. And in order for us to communicate, we drew pictures back and forth to one another. I learned the power of communicating with images through my uncle, Freddie. My mother, or should I say super mom, she worked in a factory, she was a waitress, and she had a part-time catering business. But she also had a hobby. She used to enter contests that were offered on the back of cereal boxes and soap boxes in the 60s. That's why I'm wearing this shirt. It's sort of a 70s style shirt. At any rate, she used to win these contests a lot. So I might be home like on a Saturday morning and up would pull a big delivery truck. The guy would bring the box out. My ma and I would run up and open it. It'd be a candy apple red stingray bicycle with a banana seat and high handlebars. Was I excited? But my ma taught me that if you work hard, you could be rewarded. You may be rewarded for that. Then there's my father. You know, if my ma worked that hard, maybe my dad didn't pull his weight, right? But he had a hobby too, and he got paid for it sometimes, and that was he was a magician. And he used to practice his tricks at home. So I'm coming home, like again, let's say Saturday, except in the afternoon, I'm thirsty. I want some red Kool-Aid, the kind that stains your mouth red around. Come running into the front room. My dad's practicing. He has my ma laid out in a long box like a coffin. Her feet are sticking out here. Her head is sticking out here. And he's sawing her in half. I'm like, now that affects a kid. It makes you, <laughs> you know, so, so that leads me to, you know, why, why do we create? Why does an artist create? I have an idea why an artist might create, and I'm going to pick on all the men in the audience here if you can handle it. So think way back when your mother was giving birth to you. She's, she's screaming, she's yelling, she's cussing at her husband, your dad, and she's pushing, pushing, pushing. Out you squeeze right into the doctor's hands. Five seconds later, I'm sorry, I'm spitting. Five seconds later, you are crying, wah, 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 the big baby that you are. What has happened right there at that moment? You got yourself recognized, and you're communicating profoundly to your ma. You're saying, ma, that pain wasn't that bad. I'm here now, and you have to pay attention to me and love me unconditionally for the rest of your life. <laughs> that is crazy, precise communication. So... So now that we know why we create, as you go on, if you're an artist, you want to create meaningful art. And it's been said that in order to create meaningful art, you're supposed to dig inside yourself and drag something up like tears, fears, happiness, joy. But an artist has to do something simultaneously to that. They have to be inspired by the outside world with empathy. And when they expose themselves to the outside world, that union is where the magic takes place, where the great masterpieces lie, where the, where the hidden meaning lies. Now, I think that if an artist does that, what they're doing is they are converting thoughts, ideas, emotions, feelings, those sorts of things. They're, com they're converting that into a material form, solid form, like a painting or a sculpture that we can enjoy. Otherwise, it would just disappear. The memories would be gone and we wouldn't have it to enjoy. Now, there are um, two artists that I really like to highlight here that do this incredibly well. Michelangelo, who gives me the chills when I say his name. He's an incredible artist, a passionate, inspired, pious man who loved man created in the image of God. 
He loved women too. But they say through the gossip that he loved men more. His major, cl his major client was the church, the Pope. So he had to keep those feelings under wraps, bound up, restrained. So the Pope says, Michelangelo, I want you to paint the Sistine Chapel. He goes, no, I can't do that. I'm a sculptor. I don't paint. He's worried if he doesn't do a good job when he gets at the pearly gates, they won't let him in because he failed as a painter. So he takes all that baggage up the scaffold to the top of the Sistine Chapel, and he, he's, it's like feelings of fear, feelings of uh, love, feelings of anger towards the Pope. And then he paints the whole Sistine Chapel, and he doesn't even want to do it. And it's the, maybe the greatest masterpiece in paint ever made, and maybe never to be exceeded. Now, we come down from the scaffold, and we meet Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh, a humble artist, a modest, humble artist. He goes out to paint the wheat field painting with the cobalt blue sky and the crows flying in front of the sky, okay? So he's out there. He sets up his easel, and he starts to paint, and he starts feeling his ear. It hurts because he injured his, he cut his ear off, you know? And then he, that makes him think about his girlfriend, the reason that, the girl that dumped him, that's why he cut his ear. Then he thinks about the fact that he's not making any money. His friends are selling paintings. He's not, and he's living off of his brother. He starts to pay, pray to God. Then he remembers that's not going to work either because I got kicked out of seminary school. <laughs> the painting's finished. It's a masterpiece. It illustrates his, his failure, his loneliness, his rejection. But yet, the golden field glows back at humanity and says to us, there is still hope for us. Maybe not for me, but there's hope for you. Now, okay, we're not just at meaningful art now. We're at great creations. The creations... The great creations are just incredible. The list goes on. It's like the cave drawings, the pyramids, the Sistine Chapel, Bach's music, Shakespeare. But why and at what cost, we have to ask ourselves. Take the pyramids, for example. I don't think modern people bought by the idea of the pyramids, you know, the, the being buried there, the soul coming out, going up to the pinnacle, climbing up the pyramids to the pinnacle and then they're going to meet with a particular God of the time. I think, for me at least as a child, I thought that God was higher than that, like at least as high as the highest mountain or on top of the clouds like the paintings have it. So it's been said the modern-day equivalent to, to the pyramids is space travel, going to the moon, you know, sitting in a chair flying through the air. Thanks goes out to Louis C.K. for that one. I borrowed that one. So makes me think to say to all you young people out there, all you college students, I don't know what you're doing here. Tick, 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 tick. The time's ticking. You have to get making some stuff. Now, you, school is holding you back. Rambo. <laughs> Rambo, the French poet, did all of his masterpiece poems from the ages of like 15 or 16 and 19. You wouldn't even be out of school yet. Bernini, 10 years old, carved a sculpture of Zeus with a fawn and what else? And, and a goat was in it. It's a big sculpture. And he was 10 years old. Could you imagine his blisters at 10 years old carving that? Do you get blisters texting? <laughs> um, so I want to sum it up. I want everybody to imagine the world a better place. My daughter taught me to imagine, my daughter Amber. She was um, walking late. You know how you want your kid to walk earlier than everybody else's kid? Well, she wasn't walking early enough, so, but she did a lot of rolling. So she rolled, over to the, she rolled over to the front door, put her hands up, got up, put her hands up, looked this way and then looked that way and smiled, let go and walked all the way to the front, to the back door, from the front door to the back door, all the way in one fell swoop. She taught me, she said in that moment, she, she didn't really say that, but she said, Daddy, if you can imagine it, you can do it. Now, I also want you to 
not be afraid of the dark. The world is filled with dark and light, happiness, sadness, good and bad. Goya wasn't afraid of the dark. And then I would like to close with the idea that embrace the mystery. The world is filled with, with mystery. Frankly, I get up every morning because of mystery. Because, like, if I got up this morning and I thought that I was going to fail doing this, I wouldn't have got up. I would have got up the next day. So, <laughs> so thank goodness for mystery. And I want you to carry on from this, from, carry on with curiosity, okay? Imagine carrying on with the curiosity of a child all the way till you die. That's all I'm asking. Thank you very much.